Content warning, this contains discussion and play regarding slavery, mutations, mutilations, violence, sex, cannibalism, and animal abuse. Please be advised. This is the same content warning I gave to my players when I finished reading the tabletop role-playing game, Mutant Year Zero. I read the book to see how the tabletop experience compares to the video game, Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden, which is what this video is about. Now, the same content warning still applies, especially as we start by looking at the tabletop game. Mutant Year Zero is a game about a post-apocalyptic future. Your characters don't know what happens to the world, you don't even know how long it's been since whatever happened, all you do know is that the human race now consists of mutants and it's dying out as they can't repopulate. All you can do is try and survive. The world is a rot infested wasteland with many threats, from nature to other humans. Your characters have a home known as the Ark, though that itself has its own problems. Factions have been made, people are fighting, and the leader is dying. Maybe you can find a way to keep your species alive? That is, if you can find a way to keep yourself alive. Or just maybe you'll be able to find the fabled promised land known as Eden. This game wants you to experience the grittiness of a post-apocalyptic world. Unlike the popular Dungeons & Dragons, your character has no single health point value. Instead, you have four attributes. When attempting to do something, the value of these attributes will give you an amount of d6s that you roll along with whatever skill you're using. And that skill has its own value. All it takes is to roll a single 6 and you succeed in whatever you were trying to do. However, if you fail, things can get a bit harder. Maybe you get filled with doubt regarding your relationship with one of the bosses of the arc, or you get fatigued from running away. Failure can mean your attributes themselves lower therefore lowering the amount of dice you get. If any of these attributes reaches zero, you are broken. It could take some time to recover, or you could die unless someone comes by to help you. Mutant Year Zero's entire reward system is built to encourage you to put your character in precarious situations. Enduring and exploring a dangerous land is only a small part of this. You'll have to put your character in a position where they will have to sacrifice or risk something for another player or non-player character. At the end of the session, players and the GM go over several questions. Most literally start with, did you risk or sacrifice something for dot 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 in order to gain XP. You have mutant powers which can help you in a tense situation, however by using them there's always a chance they misfire and you lose just a little bit of your humanity. The world has no shops, instead everything is a barter system, there's an encumbrance system meaning you can't take everything with you to explore the wilderness known as the zone, and that means you also can't take everything back. Now I'm not an aficionado of post-apocalyptic media, though I found myself to be a fan of most of Mutant Year Zero. I really enjoy the setting that comes with it. The book explains what happened to the world to the GM, giving great ideas for story arcs. The more I read about it, the more excited I got to invest time into this world. It also has a game system that can be pretty cruel. There was a point while reading this that I just looked up and went... This game is mean. Aside from the attributes being your health bar, it has a critical injury table that can really fuck up your character. You could roll a gruesome critical injury, then roll for how long you have left before dying, and then roll how long it takes for you to get up before you realize your character's gone. Because you're going to bleed out and not wake up in time, and what's worse is that there's going to be no one around to help you. There's also the zone, which has several threats that if your characters don't have someone guiding them, they'll walk right into things like a magnetic field that can take away anything made out of metal, including their weapons. You can starve to death, die of hypothermia. I played a four hour one shot session with some friends, and all I can say is that I edit my earlier statement. This game can be mean. When exploring the zone, you roll on tables to determine the world, see what kind of threat our heroes face. You could be lucky on the critical injury table, and like any kind of die roll, it's pretty much all down to luck. If your players are aware of this type of setting, they'll be careful and play to their strength, which means I, as a GM, have to carefully try to push these characters to their limit in specific ways. 
The game's not pushing for an experience where all players just die in a meat grinder. It wants to have tension and character development. Characters that are trying to push through this harsh world, even though the only thing they can see on the other side is just a little sparkle of hope. Now, you won't get there in one session, though you'll start making your way. I am a fan of both the world and the dice system. The dice system looks a bit complex, though after a short learning curve, it's simple and easy to understand. There are three different types of dice, all of them D6. One is for skill value, one is base value, and one is for gear if they give you a bonus. All you need is a six. If you get more than one, you could do some cool stuff like doing more damage or finding more food. If you roll and don't get a six, it's not an automatic failure. You actually have a chance to re-roll. In fact, you can re-roll even if you succeed just to get some more sixes. By pushing your character, you can re-roll any dice that didn't come up as a one or a six. However, here comes that everything has a cost concept. Pushing yourself can give you some drama or even have gear break. And once it's broken, hopefully you know a guy who's good at repairs because you for sure can't fix it. Now, when it comes to accessories, you can buy the custom dice the game has, maps of the zone, and even cards that can help the GM randomly determine mutations or the things found in the world known as artifacts. However, there is a table equivalent to these cards inside the rulebook, and instead of custom dice, you can just use three different sets of D6s. Now, the system doesn't lean too much into combat and is more into character roleplaying. It's a game that's similar to Modiphius' other game, Tales from the Loop, with just a bit more complexity. It's a style of roleplaying I prefer to play. I particularly enjoy these games because character creation feels like a group effort to bring these characters to life. In Tales from the Loop, it's a group of friends living in a weird, more technologically advanced 80s. Here, it's a group of survivors coming from a community which the players also build. It's the player's decision to decide where the arc is, what it looks like, and how it's developed. We have only 12 points? Yep. Yeah. Jesus. I know. Which means, for the most part, they're all probably going to suck, but oh, yeah. we can choose to specialize in one area or another at the expense of one of the skills. I think food should, should suck. Yeah, I agree. They get to say if the arc is culturally developed or more advanced in technology, or maybe neither, though they are fine with food and won't starve. Or it's none of that, and the arc is just in a well-defended spot. Now, while I enjoy many aspects of this game, such as the dice system, what this game wants players to experience, and the kind of roleplay that it encourages, there are some things you should be aware of. It's hard to have a harsh world without some dangers and villains. Monsters that want to harm our heroes and kill them in the zone. Because of that, there needs to be a combat system. It's fine, just don't expect a heavy, crunchy system. At the beginning of combat, you all roll initiative. When it's your turn, you can do one of two things. The first is by doing an action such as using any skill, like fighting for close combat or shooting for ranged combat. The other thing you can do is a maneuver. A maneuver is anything that isn't covered by a skill, such as reloading, pulling out gear, changing your character's relative distance to another character. The range is in abstract space with labels of arm's length, short, near, and long. All weapons have a distance label to note where to use them. It expects players and GM to specifically narrate what the environment is like and what characters are doing. If you're not used to a system like that, it could be difficult to remember some details, let alone get used to it. Even I forgot a player could be further away and avoid danger due to his weapon's distance during our one shot. It still played out fine. Another thing to be aware of is that the game tells GMs don't make a grand plan, which is understandable. Every game session begins with a new threat being introduced to the arc if any of the characters are there. By the rule set itself, it's pretty random by either rolling on the table or drawing a card. The game even notes what a typical session is like. Now, this doesn't mean do not prepare for the session. I gave my players two options on how we wanted to play. Did we want to play fresh from the arc or did we want to jump into an introductory adventure that the book has? We chose the former which I just improv through since we made characters and then immediately started playing. In hindsight, if I was to play this game again or do a campaign, the one thing I would do for prep is to prepare some of the zones. 
See, the zones have a bunch of tables that you can roll on in order to make the wilderness. First, it's the wilderness type, and rolling on what type of ruins, if any, then see the rot level, which is basically radiation level, followed by the threat level to figure out how dangerous it is, then what type of threat it is, then what the threat actually is, also if there are any artifacts, pulling out cards to see what players can actually find. As you can see, this gets to be a lot, which also leads to a lot of dice rolling and looking over tables which may not be that great to do during session since it impedes the flow of the game and can get quite tedious, even with roll 20. Thankfully I did some of the rolling while we were taking a break, though next time I would do it before the sessions. Now you don't have to use all the tables, the game even says that these are guidelines. It says to just pick stuff that makes sense in your world. The last thing I want to say about this game deals with the content warning I gave at the beginning. The game itself does not have one, nor makes you aware of any safety devices for role-playing games, at least none that I saw, and these are all things that can happen in your game. In this printing of the game, one of the character classes is literally called the Slave. Another class is the Dog Handler, who has a relationship with protecting their dog, which means bad things can happen to the dog. If this is selected, the player is telling me as the GM, put me in a situation where the dog can be harmed or taken away from me. The critical injuries can get a bit gory, cannibals are a threat in the zone, sex can happen in the game, like any game. If there are any aspects of the game you want to try to get around, it is possible. You just have to check with your players on what type of game you want to play. Draw some hard lines and talk with everybody about what is the limit and what to use. If you're uncomfortable with the class known as slaves, don't use that class or don't use this printing. There's a different printing that labels the class as Grunt if it helps you feel better. Though be aware that just because you change the name doesn't mean it's not slavery, fucking American prison system. You don't have to play into the sex, you don't have to choose that relationship for the dog handler if it makes someone uncomfortable with the idea of animal abuse. You don't have to be descriptive or describe the critical injuries, just say it as a mechanic. And just because the game gives a harsh world doesn't mean it can't be fun or funny. Remember, the world is long gone, and these artifacts are all things that we, as players and as people, know what they are, but the characters don't. Just try describing what a guitar is without specifically saying that it's a guitar, and how it's being worshipped by a cult. Uh, by the way, when you, you guys are now close enough to see this, it is a strange and brittle wood contraption with strings stretch across a hole in the middle. Against all odds, it has survived the apocalypse with barely a scratch right now. These motherfuckers are trying to learn Wonderwall. They must be slow. <laughs> I would like to play this game again, though I'm also enthralled by the setting. There are three other rule books about mutant animals, robots, and space enclaves that I'm now really contemplating on getting. My players also enjoy the game. I may change the combat a bit or not fret about it too much in a future game, though now that I've taken a look at the tabletop experience, Let's see how it relates to Mutant Year Zero, Road to Eden. Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden is a tactical turn-based role-playing game developed by the Bearded Ladies Consultant and published by Funcom. The first, most obvious difference is the game's combat mechanics. Because of the tactical grid-based combat, you now have more precise stats than the tabletop game. The game tells you the chance weapons have to hit, the chance to do critical damage that adds to the weapon's base damage, and some weapons even have a chance to have an added effect, such as disabling mechanical enemies or igniting an enemy on fire. Instead of multiple health attributes, characters now have a single health bar that will deplete as they take damage. Now there is no character creation. Instead, you start the game with two characters known as Ducks and Bormi. Two characters that you will not be able to make in the base tabletop games as they are animal based, which is in the Mutant Year Zero GenLab Alpha Core Rulebook. Oh wait. Yeah, you can't even make them with that. Alright, whatever. As you go throughout Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden's story, you'll get more mutants who will join your party. These characters are different from one another in terms of mutant powers, though not in terms of classes. Characters don't have different classes. While there is one or two mentions of other classes that reside in the Ark, 
they are mostly absent from the video game, even in the arc, which now serves more as a hub area for you to upgrade weapons, buy equipment, and trade in artifacts for skills that affect the entire party. The video game has you play as a team of stalkers going throughout the zone. In the book, stalkers are the class that have a specific skill that makes them great to have in a party that is going into the zone. They have a skill called Find the Path, which allows them to find a safe path and spot trouble in the zone before it spots you. If they have a successful roll that has more than one six, they can also find artifacts, food and water, bullets, and even know the general level of rot in the area in order to warn the party. However, in the game, it seems to label them as the ones that are not affected by rot radiation in the zone. Hence, they are the ones to go out and explore. You also don't get to feel the real effect of the stalker class as you don't have to worry about rot, bullets, food and water, or anything like that. This comes to what I would say is the main difference from the video game versus the tabletop game. It's where each game decides to put tension that the players have to deal with. In the base tabletop game, it's almost everything with the idea of that risk versus reward on most mechanics. For example, in the tabletop game, you can only get new mutations if you roll to use a mutation and it misfires. By rolling on the misfire table, there's a chance that your character will permanently lower one of their attribute scores, however, you'll also get a new mutation. In the video game, you get the mutations without any of that risk. Every time you kill an enemy, you gain experience points and when you get enough, you level up and earn points that you can use to buy new mutations. Each character can learn several different mutations, though you can only have three equipped for battle. One major mutation, one minor, and one passive mutation. The tension in the video game is more on combat and battles. You only have a team of three mutants at any time, and the game loves to throw multiple enemies at you. It's probably not a good idea to take on a group of ten enemies. Not only are there different types that can do different abilities, they can also all move at the same time, so you can be flanked and taken out pretty quick. However, you can stealth kill any enemies that wander away from the main group, though if they notice you, they will alert the rest of the pack. It's not worrying about survival resources, instead it's more that, can I survive this encounter worry? The game wants you to take time to try stealth kill enemies and plan out an attack that will help you win against the odds. Now, there's a bunch of other smaller differences that I'm just going to rattle off real quick. There's no melee weapons, no skills, no encumbrance system, mutants share quite a bit of the same mutant powers, while the tabletop book recommends that players have different mutations, no bartering, you have no say in how the art grows, artifacts cannot be used to better it, and not nearly the same large bestiary of enemies as in the book. Now, it seems like there's a lot of differences from the tabletop game, however, there's still a good amount of things that are similar and make it Mutant Year Zero. There are a few minor things from artifacts that are still fun to come across as they are once again very vaguely and incorrectly described, to mutant powers that are also still pretty similar to the book, and even the game's graphic environments are very similar to some of the illustrations that are in the book. Though the biggest similarity to the tabletop game is the story, which to me is a bit of a detriment. As the name implies, the game's main plot is about the promised fabled land called Eden, which is a big plot arc in the core rulebook that GMs can lead their players through. Even the separate adventures that the core rulebook comes with have advice on where you can place artifacts and clues that lead to Eden. The video game doesn't take the same path as the rulebook and its adventures, though it still leads to the same conclusion, which makes it hard for me to recommend to my players to play Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden because I do want to run this plot point. I want to run a campaign of a community trying to survive the wilderness and slowly coming to the terms that they may have to search for Eden. I want to experience how my players and their characters interact with each other and talk about how they feel about Eden and more. The video game has its characters react to it, though it's not that satisfying. Most of the story is told from the point of view of Borman. There is some interaction between him and the others, though at some point it comes to them just making an offhand comment about the world while not talking to others about it. It really depends on who you have as your chosen character at the time, which 
makes you realize how average the video game is as a video game. It's not a bad game, yet it doesn't do much to make it amazing. As a video game, it's fine, it's average, 5 out of 10 if we're going by math and not the American education system. One of the characters in the trailer does not have the same abilities as they do in the game. There are constant texture pop-ins. The game has crashed on me once or twice, you never really get to enjoy the party. The characters all have names, though you'll know them more for their powers and how they work. It has a solid tactical combat system, however most of the time I was able to use the same strategy for sneaking in and killing enemies. Silent shot with two of my characters, and if that didn't take the enemy out, use Borman's charge ability to knock them out for a couple more turns while not alerting the enemy. Because of this, I usually stuck with the same party for most of the game. Speaking of enemies, there was a lack of variety with the enemies. Even in the DLC, they had mostly the same enemies with a different coat of paint. There were a few times the game threw interesting and new challenges to you, and it was great when they did, though it quickly reverted back to the repetitive nature of the game. It's pretty much an experience that I can only describe as, it was fine. If I was to recommend the video game, it wouldn't be to my players or people interested in Mutant Year Zero, the role-playing tabletop game. Instead, I would recommend this to GMs, especially if you're like me and not deep into post-apocalyptic media. Due to my most recent influence with that genre being Mad Max Fury Road, I describe my world with little trees, decrepit buildings, and more rolling hills than anything. However, playing this game really showed me how the world of Mutant Year Zero could be a lush forest, to how descriptive it could be with old tunnels and factories, to even a tundra wasteland. The next time I'm playing the tabletop game, I'm going to open up the video game. Though, not to play it, instead to take notes on what the world could be and get better at describing it. And if you aren't interested in the tabletop game and just want a decent tactical game that can kill some time, yeah, I say pick up Road to Eden. It's fine. I can faintly see the letters. T O R C H. Torch! But it's a pretty crappy torch, as it's not giving as much light as my flashlight, and it's too heavy. I've seen one of these in Hammond's workshop. It's for melting two pieces of metal together. Don't stare at the light, it will blind you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Let me know of any board games or tabletop based media in the comments below. And if you played either the tabletop game or the video game of Mutant Gear Zero, let me know of your thoughts as well. That's all for now. If you like what you saw, remember to give this video a like. Also click that subscribe button and click the bell as well in order to be notified when the next video comes out. If you want to support the channel, I got a Patreon and a Ko-fi set up where I put videos out a day early or maybe a little bit more. Links for those and all social media in the description below. Until next time, I'll see you then.